Welcome, Bruchim Habayim. My name is Michael Siegel. I'm the senior rabbi of the Anshi Emet Synagogue. Anshi Emet is nearing its 150th year, and we pride ourselves on being a congregation that has long served as a forum for the discussion of important ideas, events, and issues that fake us, face us locally and globally. My wife Janet and I have had the privilege of welcoming dignitaries, thought leaders, and members of our community into our home for important conversations. Our gathering today continues that tradition as we consider the impact of the Abraham Accords in a conversation we have titled Hope, Light, and Joy, the renormalization of relations between Israel and Morocco. Special thanks to Mimi Wittberg, our assistant executive director, who has helped to coordinate this day. We are honored to co-sponsor this event with the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, a think tank that does so much to advance the public discourse on global issues. If you are not familiar with their important, I would strongly recommend a visit to their excellent website and taking part in their upcoming programs. I'm especially honored that Jenny Sisner, the Chief Operating Officer, and Marilyn Diamond, who serves on the Chicago Council's Board of Directors, are both part of the Anshiamit community. We are living in remarkable times, are we not? Who would have imagined even a year ago that the UAE brain Morocco and Sudan would be joining in signing a document with the United States and Israel that begins with these words. We, the unsigned, recognize the importance of maintaining and strengthening peace in the Middle East and around the world based on mutual understanding and existence, as well as respect for human dignity and freedom, including religious freedom. We encourage efforts to promote interfaith and intercultural dialogue to advance a culture of peace among the three Abrahamic religions and all humanity. I thought about this yesterday on the same day when Jews throughout the world read the story of Moses and the children of Israel leaving Egypt, breaking the chains of slavery and marching forward. And how Pharaoh and his army chased after the Israelites and trapped them in front of the city. It appeared as though there was nowhere to go but back to the past, back to slavery. And as we all know, the sea split and the people walked through in safety. Who could have imagined such a thing? And yet it happened. A new day had dawned. A song of wonder was sung, animated by faith, hope and a sense of wonder. I believe that we are in such a moment when our eyes can scarcely be believe what has transpired. The Abraham Accords is a wondrous achievement that has parted the waters to new possibilities of cooperation and security that will benefit all peoples in the region and beyond. All of the leaders who signed the document showed remarkable courage and vision. All are we of praise. Most certainly, Majesty King Mohammed VI played a significant role, as did his father, King Mohammed V, in laying groundwork over a period of years that helped to make the Abraham Accords a reality. Ladies and gentlemen, we would well to pay attention to another lesson that the Torah offers us this day. Kriyat Yam Suf, the splitting of the sea, happened at the beginning of glory and not the end. A long path remained before the people that would need to be traversed before they would reach their goals. Challenges of every sort awaited them. But we also know that because the people walked together with a deep awareness of the future that they were bequeathing to their children, they persevered and eventually fulfilled their dreams. Abraham Accords mark a beautiful beginning. Borders are opening, cooperation has begun, 
more countries will join and people are traveling, engaging with one another and learning about each other. The song of the new day is beginning to be sung, but we are just at the beginning. A myriad of issues need to be discussed, not least of which are those relating to the Palestinians. But on this day, let us thank God that we are on this path, that we are on the way. As we begin our program, I do want to acknowledge Marilyn Diamond, who serves as Honorary Council General of Morocco to Chicago, who was the inspiration and catalyst for today's event. Marilyn, we thank you all that you do and for making this gathering a reality. Special thanks to all of our panelists. We are truly grateful that you have taken the time to share your wisdom with us this day. Finally, it is so special to have Mr. Andre Azulai with us this day. Mr. Azulai is a true hero in our time. He has served as counselor and most senior advisor to King Mohammed VI of Morocco as for his father. All of us applaud you for a lifetime of service to the Kingdom of Morocco and to the Jewish people. And I should note that in a trip that our congregation took to Morocco, our time with you marked one of its highlights. And so we look to each of you, all of our panelists, to learn, to grow, and to continue singing Long of Hope as we go forward together. Rabbi Siegel, thank you so much for your inspiring remarks and your very kind words. And thank you for co-sponsoring this important event. I'm grateful to have you both as my spiritual leader and my friend. Andre, it's wonderful to see you again, my friend. And I thank you on behalf of everyone for sharing your time and your wisdom with us today. We're here today to talk about the renormalization of relations between Morocco and Israel, how this came to be, why it is unique within the Abraham Accords, and where our experts are going. Andre, before we begin our conversation, I'm going to speed race through history to provide a context for audience to this consequential decision. Morocco is home to North Africa's largest Jewish community which has been there since ancient times and grew with the arrival of the Jews expelled from Spain in 1492. The Jewish population of Morocco reached an excess of approximately 250,000 people in the late 1940s, making it 10% of the national population of Morocco. Today, about 1,000 Jews remain in the country. Andre, you have no peer. You have had a front row seat to the history of modern Morocco. Your intelligence, your integrity, and wisdom have placed you in a role described by Rabbi as counselor, senior advisor to King Mohammed VI and his late father, King Hassan II. You have also distinguished yourself on the world stage, a leader on issues of interfaith dialogue and peaceful coexistence between individuals, communities, and countries. Let's start with your experience living as a Jew in Essaouira, Morocco, your birthplace. How do you think growing up Jewish in Muslim majority Morocco in, during the Holocaust shaped who you are? Andre, I think you have to unmute yourself. Hello. I'm so good. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you, uh, 
Rabbi Siegel, you were boss, so kind and so generous with your words about me. And uh, I am also deeply grateful to you to have me this evening, sorry, evening in Morocco, uh, attending this panel and this webinar. It's a very special time for all of us. Very special and very challenging. But let us tonight celebrate. Celebrate, as you said, this uh, unexpected but much expected by all of us in the region to restore hope to restore trust and to restore confidence. Confidence in the whole region. My understanding and my vision regarding the Abraham Accords is that we have to look at it the first step as a gateway or as a, a starting or a restarting point to do all what we can to leverage this momentum to restore the peace spirit, the culture of peace and to be all of us committed to use this uh, breakthrough first again in all our countries addressing the public opinion the societies the institution the executive people the decision makers that talking to each other, listening to each other will and could change what the situation we were confronted to all along the last decade. I personally belong to a group who never lost hope, who never give up to give a chance to peace, to a global peace, to an inclusive peace, to a peace which respect the justice, dignity, freedom, which is at its best, this justice, dignity, and freedom is enjoyed by all. I think, Rabbi Siegel, that when we were together in Morocco, I told to you, or I said to the group, that the way I was educated as a Jew, Jewish person, in my beloved hometown, Esawi Ramogador, educated by my rabbis, educated by my teachers in the Jewish school, was first to share or to give a chance for the one I have in front of me to enjoy the same justice, to enjoy the same freedom, to enjoy the same dignities on myself. It was my way, Oliver, to be just a person, a normal person, and a Jewish activist, if I may say that. It was my Moroccan way to make 
coherent and to make concrete in my daily life my citizenship as a Moroccan and my Jewishness. That's why I see the Abraham Accord, I hope, as the process we will move forward and the process we will pave the way for a two-state solution. My country, and it was clearly explained and said by my king, by His Majesty the King Mohammed VI, when celebrating the renormalization between Morocco and Israel, he said that, I mean, it will help, it will serve, it will give a chance to a rebound and a restart and a, a kind of mobilization as large as possible by all the key player in our region and all in the US and all around to think how to come back to the two-state solution. I mean, the state of Israel and the state of Palestine living side by side with a comprehensive and a just last peace. And I think by the fact that now, I mean, we will discuss, we will met, we will exchange, we will know more about our societies, our public opinions, we will try to avoid to have, like it was in the past, so many missed rendezvous, so many missed opportunities, and so many chances we spoil. to give a chance to adjust this. We lost years. We were confronted to so many tragic events on both sides. The situation is still very fragile on that point. But I think that we are now maybe in a different position to be more uh, easily committed, easily prepared to restart. Okay. And in that perspective, as you said, Rabbi Siegel, and you mentioned it also, Morocco is definitely a key player. Because we have this uh, very strong, powerful difference and asset by, you know, having, as you said, a Jewish, very solid, very deeply rooted in the mindset of the Mar Moroccan people living in Morocco or living abroad, of what was, I mean, the intimacy, the proximity, the confidence. And the coexistence, not the coexistence, if I may say, way we were all along together, Muslim and Jews, for centuries or millenaries. And there is a kind of 
Moroccan magic, you know? Well, not so many now as a Moroccan Jew based in Morocco, few thousands. As it was said, 15, 16 years ago, we were close to 300,000. Magic of Morocco. The magic for us, Moroccan, but for, for let's say, the Jewish world, Israel or in the diaspora. We know Jews, as Jews, that, I mean, our heritage, our legacy, were not always a happy story in the diaspora. And usually, the Western Jewish communities, especially or particularly in Europe, they often cut the link with their memories, with their heritage. Because too many times, tragic stories, memories. And the magic of Morocco is that we have now close to 1 million Jews all around the world, but largely from far. In Israel, where the Israelis referring to Morocco as their mother or their home country, are close to a million people. No one, no one asks them or obliges them to keep alive their legacy, their memories, their heritage. They made the choice to, to keep it by themselves, not only alive, but so, so strong and lively. It's not just, I mean, celebrate a, a memory or reminding, reminding the history. It was in the daily life of all of them. We kept alive our ritual at the synagogue. I was fascinated in Brazil. Manaus, Belém, cities where so many Brazilians from Moroccan origin who married in a mixed marriage Indians. And I was fascinated listening to this, uh, the children of this mixed marriage praying in the synagogue with the Moroccan ritual, the Moroccan, the Moroccan musical tempos. I was always fascinated when meeting all around the world, in Shanghai or in Moscow, in London or in Madrid, Moroccan Jews. Keeping alive their cuisine, keeping alive their language, keeping alive their literature. I mean, all the ingredients of their daily life with the flavor, with the color of Morocco everywhere, generation after generation. We are now maybe three, four, five generations who left Morocco, where they are, I mean, and keeping it in the mindset where they are. And Morocco didn't do that to give them a chance to keep it. And by keeping it, keeping it so live in their existence in the country where they settled, it didn't make easier their lives. I'm speaking, I'm referring precisely in Israel, to Israel. I have 
kept in my memory that until the early 70s, Moroccan, Moroccan Jews were using their names, their names to make easier their daily life and preferring, in, in, I mean, in place of name Azulei to be named Mendelssohn or Finkelstein, and in place of being born in a Sawira, preferring to mention in their IDs, born in Marcelia or Aix-en-Provence. It was this period of cultural alienation. But the Moroccan heritage and legacy in Israel and elsewhere so you survive to this period. And it survives by the resilience and the commitment of the Moroccan Jews, where they were living and based. And it was a kind of exception in the Jewish world, Jewish diasporas. And if they have done it, if we have done it that way, it was because, I mean, we have not the tragic legacy or the tragic heritage, many of our fellow Jewish friends have been confronted to in so many places. I'm saying that to come back to the Abraham Accords and to the situation in the Middle East because, again, when there is something said in Morocco, something decided in Morocco, you have close to one million Israelis following it carefully. Feeling part of this situation. Trying to help, trying to sustain, to support, expressing their views, debating the issues, but with this kind of Moroccan filter or Moroccan paradigm, which could be for tomorrow an important lever to try to again spread this pedagogy of peace. And to tell the countries where they are that there is a good and a peaceful future between Jews and Muslims, between Arab countries and Israel, between our civil societies. And let me, maybe I've been too long. Uh, Marilyn, please feel free to stop me and to uh, when it is. Let me conclude, conclude on this first introduction. That for the sake of making durable, making solid, making stable, this rebound of the peace culture, the peace dynamic, new dynamic, we have to give the best chances possible to our civil societies by discussing together, exchanging together, knowing more about other. In a Sawira, for instance, as you know, some of you know, we have a kind of annual 
rendez-vous once a year. We have so many, but there is one very special once a year, which is uh, a festival, music festival, but it's more than music, Festival des Andalusie Atlantique, which is the only one in the world. And I'm so proud as a Moroccan citizen to share with you this experience. It's the festival in the world which decided by choice to make or to dedicate the stages of those festivals during four days, four nights, 24 hours a day. The stage are only for musicians, singers, dancers, Muslim and Jews. It's fascinating. It's a rendezvous for Islam and Judaism, where both are coming to, to sing with each other, to dance with each other, to perform music together, and to debate together. Every morning during this festival, there is a forum. speeches, free debates, no taboo, malibu. People are debating for hours. People are crying because so happy to break this uh, kind of wall who too, for so many years, too long years, there was no debate, no meetings, no free debates. And it changed a lot. And there are not only, I mean, there are thousands of Jews and non-Jews and thousands of Muslims attending this festival year after year after year. And it never ends. I mean, people don't want to the conference room. They enjoyed it. They feel so moved. I mean, it's something which cannot explain. We have to. You have to. I hope that one day all of you will have the possibility to attend this festival. This festival. But that, what I can tell you that after 17 years of experience with this festival, this festival, then after having close to 4,000, 5,000 people attending every night, many of them, I mean, I'm in touch with them. We exchange letters, they publish articles, they give speeches in, at the universities, they join think tanks, and they said how by sitting or attending this kind of events gives them the opportunity to see differently when it comes to relation between the Middle Eastern countries and Israel, the Arab countries and Israel, the Jews and the Muslims. There is a different way understanding, to join it. And as you probably know, Marilyn, I'm sure you know, Rabbi Siegel the same, Mark, maybe you follow. Omar, I know that you knew. His Majesty the King Mohammed VI, a year ago, but the fact, I think that it was in January 2020, January 15. He came to preside and to attend the official opening of Beit Dekira. Beit Dekira is now in Arabic, the house of memory. And in this case, it was the house of the Jewish memory in Esauera, or in Morocco at large. But Esauera was probably the only city in the Muslim world 
from Morocco to Indonesia, who usually you don't find in Islam, on the Islam soil, a non-Muslim majority. The case in the Sahara in the 19th century and the early 20th, when the Jews were the majority. And the Sahara at that time was, in the 19th century, basically the economic, the diplomatic capital of Morocco and the King Mohammed the third was largely based in Israel. And speaking to you, and you are in Chicago, I think that I said that when we met uh, Rabbi Siegel, and uh, I said that to you so many times, Marilyn, that the very first Jewish person elected in the US history elected at the Senate, first Senate, one Moroccan Jew from a family of a Sawira, a Jewish family from a Sawira. And it was also the Mohammed III, the Sultan at that time, who made Morocco the first country in the world to recognize America based in the Sawira. And I know now, after we made some research for the library and the study center of Bedakia, that the person who contributed to the writing of the Treaty of Recognition by Morocco, the United States of America, was the grandfather of the one who was elected after. David Yuli Levy, Levi was the one elected and his grandfather was one of the glorious, was one, was one, was one, excuse me, of my prestigious predecessors as advisor of the Sultan at that time. So I was fascinated by this story. And also by the fact that between the two, the grandfather and the grandson, the father of the one who was elected, wrote and published one of the very first, very first ever published in the US, book published in the US, calling for the end of slavery in America. Andre? Yeah, I finished, uh, Marilyn. Sorry, but I just want to tell you that how deep and uh, uh, mind, uh, I mean, how deep and strong is our heritage boss. Sorry if I've been too long. Not at all. I just would love to get to um, some more questions, but um, I think our time is up, and I thank you for enlightening us and filling us in and the unique history of not only the experience of Jews in Morocco, but how they carried that forward out into the diaspora. Um, hopefully during the question and answer period, I will get to ask you a couple of questions that we didn't have time for, unfortunately, but it's always a privilege, Andre, to be with you and to have you share your experience and your wisdom with us. Thank you so much and we'll see you back during the panel discussion. We're going to break now for about two or three minutes just so we can transition into the next section of the program and um, give anybody a, a chance who wants to get a drink or whatever. And we will be back with you in a couple minutes. Thank you so much.
and noting with joy that it's still snowing. <laughs> Marilyn, you can uh, go ahead and begin. Thank you. We are privileged to be joined now by a panel of experts, every one of whom brings a unique perspective to the topic at hand. On a personal note, each of you has enriched my life and stretched my mind. And I have no doubt that by the conclusion of the program, our audience will share my sentiments. Before we begin a few housekeeping details, you have five minutes for your respective topics. And if you don't use it all, your fellow panelists are free to jump in comments and questions. Following this segment, we'll be taking questions that have been pre-screened from the audience. And during that segment, we will grab by Mike Siegel and Council Fellow Cecile Shea. Lori, we're going to begin with you. You are the Margaret E. Burton Professor of Surgeon and Ethics at the University of Chicago and advisor to the Provost for Programs and Social Ethics. Prior to this, you served as Dean of the Divinity School at the University of Chicago, making you the first woman and the first Jew to serve as Dean of a Divinity School based at an American university. You also have as many degrees as a thermometer. They include topics such as women's studies, neonatal nursing, English, and religious studies, to name a few. You have taught and written extensively on public policy in bioethics and religious studies. Building on Andre's work in, on religious coexistence, will you talk to us today about how the practices of interreligious dialogue 
play a role in public discussion and public policy, and what practical applications might we draw from this? I think you're muted, Laura. <laughs> no matter how long we do this Zoom, we'll always make that mistake. <laughs> I wanted to say thank you, first of all, to my to um to you who's put this panel together and who's just you're an extraordinary inspiration to me as a leader of the city of Chicago and and an ambassador of peace between our country and the, the Kingdom of Morocco. It's a privilege to be here. And thank you to my other panelists. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing all, all of your remarks and hearing what you have to say. Um, I wanted to start by saying it's a privilege to be here as a scholar. The Talmud tells us when there is a book, there is no, there is always peace. There can't, you can't have war and book in the same, in the same social space. So I'm here to promote the idea of the book and the interesting and powerful thing about the book that we share with colleagues across um, religious differences in the mission and in the Muslim communities is that we share a scripture where the name of God is always peace. And among the many multiple names of God in Torah, of course, the name of peace. God is the God of peace. Um, for us in Torah, it is um, peace is the name of God in the Quran. And of course, Jesus is the Prince of Peace in the New Testament. And it's with that understanding that peace begins with um, understanding that the God of worship, the God that we follow, is a God that shares with us a vision, a world of peace. And that the way that the rabbis of the Talmud imagine the world to come, imagine um, the end of days is not as, um, not as a, in a triumphant way, but in a quiet way with wolves and lambs lying down with, with enemies being friends, being beloved companions. And it's in the name of that that I think the possibilities of, of peace and interaction are so important to us. I wanted to say just two things. One is about why, about something about Abraham and then something about the practice of scriptural reasoning, which is just, I think a, a practical application of how peace works out when you put books at the center. So Abraham, as in the Abraham Accords, we are told by the rabbis in Tulin, uh, practice of Talmud, that Abraham is given two extra commandments, two special extra commandments. And they're strange commandments. One is the commandment of, of, of the red heifer, of ashes. Another is uh, a commandment of the tefillin, of lotteries in daily prayer. For, for, and, and the question is, why is this? And this is to celebrate two times when Abraham was not for himself, but for another. Of course, famously, Abraham gets the reward of a commandment because he argues on behalf of all of the people of, of, the, of Saddam when he tries to defend them against the, against the justice that's about to confront them. And even against this notion that they've done a bad, they've been bad and, and corruptible, Abraham still wants there to be peace. Abraham still wants there to be mercy and pleads with God himself saying, I am but ashes and dust, um, yet I come before you in the name of this crazy idea peace, even for people who are my enemies, who threaten my family, even to that, to them, that, that that's the moment in which Abraham, Abraham's for the other is so much greater than the for himself is what makes the world whole, one commandment. And the second time Abraham was given the special commandment is because after the war with the three kings, he refuses to take any plunder from the war. He steps back and says, I won't even take a strap or a thread, and therefore he's given these of wrapping himself in straps and wearing threads of blue. And the notion is that you step back from, you step back from the glory of war and the conflict in a reflective way. And what you get is the reward of daily um, ad adherence and daily connection between yourself and the God of peace. This notion of peace as stepping, as stepping away from what you, your ego could take into a world in which you are entirely for the other deeply a part of the, the Talmud, deeply a part of not Tulin, but much of the Talmud, and deeply a part of the prophetic traditions um, that exist not only in the Jewish, but in the Islamic tradition as well. So in the name of that, in the name of those Abraham affords, Abraham is said in the Talmud to give these, these, um, these mitzvot to all of his children, meaning Ishmael as well as Isaac. Um, he gives these commandments to all of his children, and, and, and which is an interesting, interesting moves that the rabbis make. And it is the giving of these commandments that is, um, that is at the end of the, that which holds up the world. The arms of the world are the arms of a, a God who, who is a God of peace. So this, this notion of what an Abraham Accord would be 
an accord of stepping back, stepping back from the possibility of victory, stepping back from victory of a, uh, from plunder, stepping back from glorying in war, back into the silence and into the quietude and into the reflective nature of what it means to study together and to read together. For the past 25 years, I've been involved in a practice called scriptural reasoning, which is um, a bringing together of Jews and Muslims and Christians to read together the text that we share in common, the text of the Torah, of the Quran, and of the New Testament. And in that practice, what we found is the extraordinary way in which different communities that share, um, that actually share much about how we think the world is organized and ordered, the primacy of the good, the nature of the being for the other is the center of the world, how that practice in fact has enabled us to make peace in rooms small and in rooms large. You see in that coming together, when our three religious traditions, our scholars come together and read together and think together, the possibility of a world in which in fact, um, there is a time of quietude and peace. There is a time of reflection and there is of sharing both the joy of scripture, the joy of scholarship and, and the possibilities that it creates. The accords that we celebrate today and take a moment to celebrate the extraordinary um, wonder of the possibility of peace in a region that has seen so much conflict. The accords we celebrate today and take time to say, isn't this a moment of beauty and of light in the middle of a world that is so torn and so angry and so terrified of one another? This, these, these accords are also not only just formal accords of trade, formal accords of, of, um, of of diplomacy, as important as that is, but they're also accords to read together. They're also accords to see our scriptures through to get to one another. They're also the possibility that in fact, times of study can be shared as, as well as times as we've just learned of dance and song. And it's this study that is so central to our traditions that I have I feel enormous trust in, enormous faith in. Um, it's my hope that in a world where we can, meet face to face. We can also meet text to text, spend time reading our text together, um, minding our text for the great beauty that's there and reading again the name, the name that we find, the name of God that is of course the name of Shalom, the name of, the name of peace. Thank you. Lori, thank you so much for sharing those important insights with us. And as my grandmother used to say, from your mouth to God's ears, so um, I, a couple of our panelists seem to have disappeared, um, but I'm, I'm going to take advantage of Omar being here right now. And Omar, we began the program with Andre, and I'd like to talk to you and pick you and Andre in a way as bookends, because together you are bookends to the unique cultural, political, religious, and social ecosystem that is Morocco, an ecosystem that nourished Andre's work and commitment to Muslim Jewish relations and your work on the Jewish people of North Africa with a focus on the Holocaust. Omar, you are Associate Professor of Sociology and Cultural Anthropology at UCLA and an academic advisor to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC. You were born and raised in an extended family on an oasis in Southern Morocco to parents who had no formal education. At an early age, you practiced farming and herding. To that end, I have a couple of questions for you. Talk to us about your path to education and how it came to be that you developed an interest in Jewish-Muslim relations in Morocco with a focus on the Holocaust. Uh, thank you, Marlin. Uh, it's really an honor and a privilege to share this stage with this uh, esteemed panelist. Uh, let me first uh, situate my work before I talk about the the, the focus on the Holocaust, or at least the Vichy, what I call the Vichy uh, policies in North Africa. Uh, I, I began my work as, a, as an anthropologist and a historian 
focusing on the Jews of the Sahara. And the reason why I planned this work because I wanted to shift the focus from studies, histories, and anthropologies uh, on Jews that focus on Jews to studies that focus on Muslims. Because as Andre mentioned, you cannot talk about Judaism in Morocco without having a discussion about Islam and the relationship between Jews and Muslims. So, and in order to do this, you have to dig out stories of Muslims. You have to tell in absence, as Jews migrated and left to Israel and other part of the world, as you start seeing this absence of Jews in the Sahara, that's my focus, my primary focus at the beginning of my research, then what is, how do you, how do you account for these memories? What is the relationship? How does Judaism survive this, in these areas where there are no Jews, but there are still, the, the, the shrines, their cemeteries are still left there. So that was the, for me the, the, the beginning of this research. And what I learned from this, re this research, especially from the wisdom of the great grandparents and the parents, is that these, relation, these connections were built on relations, on social relations, on economic relations that were grounded in understanding, in indigenous understanding of Judaism and Islam. And because of that, that's why I think Moroccan, when Jews left and Moroccan stayed, when Jews come back, that connection has always been maintained. And it has also, as, as, as Andre mentioned in his introduction, it has survived because of the, because of how these generations, older generations were able to communicate these stories to the children and the grandchildren. So that's, that's what I would say as far as, as, my, as, as, the, as, the, as the beginning of, of the research, where the research started. Um, I wanna ask you another question, picking up on comments that Andre made about the commitment of Moroccan Jews who live in the diaspora to Morocco. Last year, I attended an event in LA where you were a keynote speaker. It was a tribute to King Hassan II and King Mohammed VI, and it was sponsored by a Moroccan synagogue. The hundreds of people who filled the hotel ballroom, excluding members of the royal family and maybe a few others, were four generations of Moroccan Jews, all of whom were dressed in traditional Moroccan clothing. And the many young children joined their parents, their grandparents and great grandparents in singing the Moroccan national anthem with joy on their faces and many with tears in their eyes. I had never witnessed a diaspora Jewish community or known of any diaspora Jewish community that felt any affection or loyalty to its ancestral homeland. How do you explain that? I don't think there is anything strange in that. Personally, as a, as a scholar, I, have, I was fascinated by this at the beginning when I started my research. And one of the things that I learned, and I think this is something that German Ayash, one of the early scholars who worked on this topic, 1978, he made the statement, which I think is a powerful statement, and it's the statement that's true today of why Moroccan Muslims who have worked on this topic continue to, to see these connections between Moroccan Jews, whether they are the, at home or in the diaspora, and Morocco as a homeland. And, and one of the things that German Ayesh uh, uh, stated is that as Jews leave, researchers and scholars have two opportunities. The ones who are at home, I mean the Muslims, they have to continue to study and to continue to build on this, on, on this tradition so that even in the absence, those connections, we can understand those connections. And the Jews who left, who goes to France or Israel or other parts of the world, they have to focus on, to, on the rituals and, and what, it, what these communities are about. So, so in my research and building on the research that has been done by other scholars like Shama Abayda and Kenbib and also before us, Haim Zahari, I think what you notice is that for Moroccan Jews, the culture, there are cultural elements and traits that 
connect Moroccan Muslims to Moroccan Jews. And you have, for instance, the case of Mimuna, which is the end of the Passover, before the, the, the return of the leavened bread, no table should start or no eating does not start with food that's being prepared by Jews. It's food that's being started by, that's prepared by Muslims. So that's, so those cultural, before we talk about the, 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 this connection, it's, it's in most ways built on those cultural understandings, those relations that we built and maintained, but they were also built on an understanding of not separation, I think crossing between Judaism and Islam, which is embedded in a, Mor in a unique Moroccan cultural uh, milieu. And that's why whether you are in uh, Brazil or China or you are in Cuba or you are in, in, in South Africa or in, even in, in Los Angeles, those connections are maintained and are also maintained through music. So uh, uh, Andre talks about music. So you have to away from the festival. The festival is just another articulation of these relationships. But the festival, the, the music and the sound actually start in the synagogue. So to be a Moroccan Jew, you actually, the liturgy and the, and the prayers begin with a sound that is Moroccan. That's, but, it, but it's also a Moroccan that's been enriched by cultures from Spain, from, and, and, from, and from North Africa, as well as other parts of, of, the, uh, of the Middle East where Moroccan Jews came from. Andre, sorry, Omar, thank you so much. I, wanna, I just wanna say to our audience that you can see what a superb scholar Omar is, but he also, when he writes, he writes with the soul of a poet. And it's evident in the title of one of his wonderful books that I highly recommend, which is called Memories of Absence. And it's the story of the memories of the Jews who have left Morocco. So thank you so much, Omar. And we'll, I'm sure, hear from you again during the q and I'm now going to turn Ahmed. Ahmed, can you turn your video on? Ahmed? Can you see me, Marilyn? I Yes, I see you. Hi, Ahmed. Hi, so good to see you again. You too. Ahmed, years ago, when we met in Chicago, I knew that I was in the presence of an extraordinary person. And that impression only grew over the years as I continued to witness the breadth and depth of your intellect and integrity, as well as your remarkable modesty in humility. And I can honestly say that if I had half of your competencies, I would be absolutely obnoxious. <laughs> so, in your role as Secretary General of the Rabita Mohammedia of Ulimas, you oversee the training of imams from countries around the world in Morocco's moderate Maliki School of Islam that embraces acceptance and coexistence. You have also done pioneering work countering violent extremism through the use of soft power, an area of expertise that has you consulting with governments around the world. So it is no surprise that when Pope Francis visited Morocco last March, he sought you out for conversations on the issues of migrants, immigration, racism, and terrorism. As a result of the Abraham Accords, do you see new opportunities for the three Abrahamic faiths to collaborate on these pressing global issues as well as any others? Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you for convening this edifying event. And thank you for having our dear Andrea Zule in the center of it. Um, Andre, Andre has taken us so generously in the genome of uh, the Moroccan uh, emotional and psychological and cultural dimensions with such clarity that we see uh, the depth of this identity. And thank you, Omar, for uh, devoting such precious and quality time to this. Thank you, Lori, for addressing this uh, uh, opportunity and talking about the Abrahamic attitude that the world needs so much. Uh, 
Our world today knows five burning problematics. And this is what brings this interfaith exercise to its functional dimension. It is not just kumbaya. It cannot be just cosmetics. It needs to be functional. And I mean by the five big axis burning problematics, the axis of fear. We, members of this extended family, are so scared of each other to the extent that we invest yearly basis $17 trillion on weaponry, $3 trillion direct expenses, and $14 trillion collateral expenses. This divided by humans on the planet would give us nearly $2,000 each. Is it not functional to invest in interfaith dialogue to spare this money and to have it invested in some functional edifying areas. Two, we are in an era in which we have become the Anthropocene, which means the disease of the planet, because we cannot see farther than our present reality. Martin Heidegger has instructed this notion of being in time. But unfortunately, we did not pay enough attention to all this thinking process. We need to realize that this home is not our home as the living generations, but also the home of the coming generations. And we need to do something about that. Abrahamic faiths coming together are initiating a dynamic that can become the critical mass to grow with time. Three addictions. All we're talking about the Titan wars that threaten that a nuclear rocket hits the bottom of the Atlantic or the Pacific Ocean and then magma comes out, game over. So it's serious, it's very serious. Investing in this direction that you're starting today, Marlene, Rabbi Siegel, and all esteemed panelists is something that we need to invest in, to promote, to take care of, because this is the future. Extremists, extremists are just one emanation of the resistance, one emanation of those tools that have been elevated under the name of identity, under the name of devotion, under the name of religiosity. But at the end of the day, they do not see how close we are how fragile these little tiny pebble dots are. So this event and unlike events are not just cosmetics. They're not just combined, they're functional. And we hope to see more of those. Extremism has its roots also in fear, has its roots in perplexity, has its roots in confusion. And we need three kinds of power, the power of clarity, the power of beauty, and the power of functionality. And Andre, what you're doing is just the elevation of beauty. Be the voice of the voiceless, to be the expression of possibility in such a world. So they are driving magnetism, and I'll just shoot them by names. The first magnetism is the magnetism of unity. They're preaching it without realizing it. The second magnetism magnetism of dignity, the third magnetism, the magnetism of purity, uh, practicing religion the way the prophets of Islam used to practice it, the magnetism of mastery, and five, the magnetism of salvation. And they are just playing those dreams and dragging in naives, dragging in the wood for the open, those youth who would just be brought to die and to keep the machinery of those billions of dollars turning billions of dollars through human trafficking, weaponry trafficking, narcotics trafficking, merchandises trafficking, antiquities trafficking, and so on. So we need to come close to each other to form this prompt that would say the Italian uh, very famous 
basta to all this. Well, there's, I would never say basta to you ever, <laughs> but I but our requiring that I say to be continued, Ahmed, to be continued. Um, I'm going to turn to you, Lonnie. Lonnie, can you put your audio on? Can you hear me? Your, uh, can you put your video, your camera on? It, it's on. Okay, there you are. I didn't Hi. play. Hi, Lonnie. Hi, Lonnie. You are no stranger to challenge. You assume the role of Midwest Regional Director of the ADL and Antonation League at age 36. When you left in 2019, anti-Semitic incidents had hit an all-time high. Similarly, months of becoming president and chief executive of the Jewish United Fund Jewish Federation of Metropolitan Chicago, the largest not-for-profit in the state of Illinois, COVID-19 hit, and the JUF became a lifeline for tens of thousands of people who needed immediate help. In both of these positions, your extraordinary leadership skills have Drawing on your collective experience and expertise, I have the famous two questions for you. You have a global pipeline into the organized Jewish community as well as the Muslim and Christian faith communities. How has the news of the Abraham Accords been received diverse entities? Okay, thanks, Marilyn. That's good. And you have a second? And the second question is, <laughs> it has to do with the significant and dramatic rise in hate crimes and hate speech. What do you attribute this to and what measures do you think would be effective in curbing it? Okay, thank you for both. Marilyn, thank you for your years of mentoring me along my road in Jewish professional life. Um, you are someone I've always looked up to, and I so appreciate your leadership on this panel as well. And to my panelists, thanks for having me on this. Um, as for the reaction, you know, both in the American Jewish community and in Israel to the normalization of diplomatic relations with Morocco, the response has been universally positive, uh, most especially amongst the one million Israeli Jews of Moroccan origin who I've been able to speak with. And I think the reason this agreement has been received with such approval, and in fact, I would say joy, is because of the informal and quiet set of positive relations that have taken place over the past three decades, which has been chronicled in this hour and a half or so um, by many of my panelists. So in other words, the establishment of public formal relations with Israel is seen as a natural outgrowth of the informal quiet relations that have taken place for so long. And, and the opening of full diplomatic relations serves, I believe, as confirmation of the earlier Abraham Accords. For many in the Arab world, they have come to is now that good relationships with Israel is in their vital interest. And for me, on a local level, we see nothing but widespread approval, and it gives us yet another opportunity and commonality with our uh, friends in the Muslim world. So we view this as a positive, and as Lori said, uh, in a year or now, getting on the second year of such blight and such um, really negative news and seeing so much destruction around us, something that's positive that brings people together and countries together is, is so, so welcomed. Um, with respect to hate crimes, and as you mentioned, I did spend a lot of my professional life at ADL monitoring anti-Semitism and hate. I'll say a couple things. One is um, there is a rise in hate crimes and that's justifiable and the FBI continues to release their numbers and unfortunately we see an increase in the actual attacks against Jews continue to be the highest among religious um, affiliations. And also, uh, we continue to see an increase year after year. We also see a rise in hate speech, which is harder to quantify, but you can just feel it. But I will say on the, on the positive side of the ledger, Marilyn, is that I don't believe that we now have 50 more million haters in America. Um, I believe that there always has been this belly of people in our country that unfortunately were infected with anti-Semitism and racism, but we were able to kind of keep it under underground, so to speak. It was more latent. Um, and what we've seen in the last couple of years has almost been this emboldening of many of these people to feel like their hateful vitriol um, is actually approved of, and they can kind of take it more into the public square and make it more kind of normalized. Um, and I also feel that those people that we've always kind of been watching are maybe even feeling more detached and isolated in a society which makes them feel sometimes helpless and it just kind of bubbles their frustration and hate. As I mentioned, the toxic nature of our polar, polarized system has increased that opportunity and in them feeling emboldened. And the last thing I think we can't ignore is 
the use of social media and the ability for people to rally around um, hateful ideologies has never been easier in a sense. And unfortunately, many of these people get stuck in their own echo chamber and really, quite frankly, and that then also leads their hate into manifesting itself into real action. So those are some of the things that, that I've noticed lately. Um, I really hope, and I think in terms of your question about curbing it, it's going to take all of us. It's going to take people um, with responsibility and a voice no, to say that this kind of hate and, and vitriol is not American. It's antithetical to who we are as Americans. And we can't normalize this type of behavior. And, and as a result, it takes all of us to make sure that these people get put back on the margins and we go back to a society that is harmonious and treats people with respect and acceptance. Which again, going back to these Abraham Accords, that's what we're talking about, which is such a great departure from some of the, the ugliness that we've seen in the last couple of weeks. Lonnie, thank you so much. And I know we're gonna to get to discuss this more when we get to the Q and A. So um, um, Mark, are you, can you start your video? My video is on. You're, there you are. Hi, Mark. How are you? Good to see everybody. And I know time is short, so please let me know what you would like. All um, right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go, I'm going to jump right in. You barely need an introduction since you're a foreign policy national security contributor to many news stations including CNN, Fox, Bloomberg, Al Arabiya, BBC, MSNBC, and on and on. You're also, the, you were ambassador to Morocco when the first Abraham Accords, when the first normalization between Morocco and Israel occurred in 1994. Currently, you are the founder and executive director of the Coalition for a Safer Web, dedicated to restricting and interrupting extremist access internet infrastructure. I'm gonna ask you to talk about that, Mark. What advice, first of all, talk about the strategies that you're using to try and interrupt these, um, this messaging and in the internet, but based on your work, what advice would you give to governments who are trying to achieve balance between free speech and national security? Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Marilyn. I remember when we first met, uh, I came to Chicago leading a Moroccan mission, uh, and you were head of the Sister Cities program. And how many years later, look, you're still involved and still providing that leadership. And I want to thank everyone for letting me be here. And most particularly, let me say a few introductory words about my friend Andre Azoulay. I was the first uh, ambassador of Jew heritage to an Arab country for the United States. And on top of that, I was raised in Israel. So I had the, uh, the dual, shall we say, mark of enable on me when I arrived in Morocco in 1994. And Andre welcomed me, uh, a young, the first, the younger, one of the youngest ambassadors in the history of the United States. I was 42 at the, at the time and God knows how many years have passed since then. He has served, he served as a mentor, as counselor, as an advisor to me and to my, uh, to my embassy staff. Uh, there is not, no one in my judgment who deserves to be viewed as a pioneer of peace between Israel and Morocco than Andre. My gosh, he deserves a Nobel Peace Prize for all of the work. And I used to say when I left Morocco and so told King Hassan, if there is anyone I ever wanted to write a, a, a biography about, it would be about Andre. And I still am saying that, Andre, to this day, uh, I still believe that you are one of the most remarkable leaders in the Middle East. With that said, let's give a context of, of this discussion and these accords. You started, Marilyn, by saying we really started this process and it began Long before me, King Hassan had a had a informal relationship with Israel that was behind the scenes, serving as a conduit for Israeli leaders. Uh, frankly, courtesy to Mr. Azulai, who served as a counselor to the king, a primary leading counselor to the king on police issues. Uh, when I was appointed ambassador, it was in the wake of the Oslo Accords. Uh, and I arrived at a, at a sense of great opportunity for peace in the Middle East. Prime Minister Rabin was alive. There was hope and expectation 
that this would bring about peace and indeed the first Middle East North, North African Economic Summit that brought the Israeli and Arab leaders, Prime Minister Perez and uh, Foreign Minister Perez, Prime Minister Rabin, Morocco, uh, with Arab leaders. We thought that expectations and opportunities would be endless at that point. That conference set the stage. Unfortunately, the second intifada brought an end to this, but yet, uh, before I left, I knew one thing, that uh, it was in inevitable that Morocco and Israel would uh, normalize its relations. So when I look at where this, these Abraham Accords have now brought us, as a Democrat who obviously has been involved in Middle East policy for decades, the Trump administration's efforts deserve to be commended. Uh, and we are grateful that at this point in time, Morocco uh, joins Bahrain, joins the United Arab Emirates, uh, and uh, as well as perhaps other countries, including Sudan in normalizing relations. But let's understand, this didn't come about in a vacuum. It came about because of the threat that Iran poses to the broader Middle East and to not only Israel, but to Arab states. And also because of the paralysis that took hold in forging any two-state solution between Israel and the Palestinians. And so if these accords are going to have the duration and durability that they deserve, a two-state solution is going to be necessary. And I know that President Biden is going to now, uh, whoever he's appointing to different positions in the Middle East, wants to re-engage with the Palestinians because uh, none of us believe that you're going to have true peace between Israel and the Arab states without finally co compelling the Israelis and Palestinians to uh, settle their differences. With that said, my work right now, Marilyn, uh, is, and I'll be short here because I know our time is late. I have dedicated sort of the end of my professional career uh, to forging a initiative to rid social media platforms of anti-Semitic and hate speech and incitement. Uh, our organization, our work has now been reported in the media. Uh, we have dedicated uh, our work to uh, ridding extremist content. I work with the FBI, I work with uh, police authorities, and I work particularly with Congress and with the Income Biden administration to forge new policies because of the threat of extremism and the threat that we see uh, from leaders uh, in the Republican Party and shall we say fringe elements in the extremist left who are using uh, the social media to promote anti-Semitic extremism. And so this is the work that I'm engaged in day in and day out. And it's going to take, shall we say, new regulations, new initiatives from Congress, and most importantly, the efforts to shut down the fringe social media platforms that promote anti-Semitism both here as well as in Europe. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you, everybody. Mark, you, I um, wanted to ask you a follow-up question on that. Um, we know that the dark web is being used by both nation state and non-state actors. Recent examples in the United States or Russia's penetration into American cyberspace, as well as the mobilization of insurrections by non-state actors on the US Capitol January 6th. Do you think it's at all possible? And I think we're gonna just jump right in and have any of our panelists who wanna to add to this. Do you think it's possible to create an international infrastructure similar to Article 5 of NATO and help combat these security threats? Indeed, uh, one of the things that, we're, that I'm working with is a very good, shall we say, yeshiva bracha by the name of Joel Finkelstein out of Princeton who has come up with the concept of forging a global forum to help regulate and independently monitor social media platforms. And here in the United States, I propose two things and it's written, been written about in the newspapers and I've been, just gave an interview on CNBC a couple of days ago on that. The first is a creation is a social media standards board that would harmonize the content requirements of social media companies. And the secondly is a social media early warning system. We were aware of the extremist threat that was going to commit violence against the Capitol days before uh, the Capitol violence occurred. So unfortunately, 
it's disparate and unconnected. And we need to connect all of these groups to authority. So that's the sh quick answer to your question. Well, I thank you so much. And I am going to have to apologize to all of the people who submitted um, questions to be answered by our panelists, because I think we have about three or four minutes, maybe three minutes left. I'm going to ask Cecile Shea, Senior Non-Resident Fellow in Diplomacy security at the Chicago Council to wrap this up for us and tell her, tell us what she thinks are the most significant takeaways from this hour and a half of conversation. But first a bit about Cecile. Cecile served as a U.S. diplomat for over two decades with many postings in Asia as well as in Edinburgh, Scotland and Tel Aviv, Israel, where she was a political policy officer. Cecile, Please help us make sense of what we've been listening to today and tell us what, your most what you think the most important takeaways are and what we should be looking for going forward. Thank you, Marilyn. And uh, thank you for all of your work putting it together. And thank you to Anshe Emmett for hosting this along with the council. We really appreciate all of your work on this important topic. And I'm really struck by how well um, Rabbi Siegel's opening and Ambassador Ginsburg's closing really tied this together. Rabbi Siegel open, opening by remind, opened by reminding us that this was at the beginning of a path, not at the end, and that we had a long journey ahead of us. And that journey, of course, um, was explained so beautifully by Dr. Azulai, as he pointed out, that our obligation as any people of any religion, he described it as his own Jewish upbringing, was to treat other people the way that we would want to be treated and to offer justice and sound politics to those around us, because that's something that we want and should not take for granted for ourselves. And so then um, Ambassador Ginsburg brought it together at the end, as he noted that what is ahead of us is to work once again toward a two-state solution, a place where the Palestinian can live and prosper and feel secure side by side with the Israel that can feel that it is secure and where people can also prosper. Um, Dr. Zoloff, I was so moved by your explanation of, of why, why we wear the physical manifestations of prayer and of Jewishness in our lives of the Talasot uh, which are the shawls that prayer shawls that Jews wear and of the various items that are tied to people's foreheads and arms during prayer, that it was a reminder that Abraham fought for compassion and for mercy for a group of people who after all were guilty for the most part for his and were his enemies. And yet Abraham argued that they deserved compassion, just as we in our daily lives should certainly argue that innocent people and also guilty people should um, receive compassion and should receive some level of mercy. Um, Dr. Boom, I, I confess I thought of my own father as you were talking about the way that Moroccans have passed down positive memories of Jews to their children. My father could have raised me to hate Poles. He could have raised to hate Germans and he made the choice not to. He made the choice not to continue legacies of hate from his own life. And I think that we all owe that to our own children and to the next generations to break these cycles of hatred and of, of, um, of demonizing those who are not like us. Um, Dr. Abadi, I think you really set up the following two speakers so beautifully when you said that the way to fight extremism is with clarity, beauty, and functionality. And Clarity is truth, which is what Ambassador Ginsburg is working toward these days. And I'm so grateful for him to be working on a problem that I've also tried to work on at the council because this is a, a, an enormous uh, challenge that is only going to get worse with deep, fake, deep fakes. So we need clarity. We need beauty, which is, I think, some, which is the same, another word for hope. It's another word for a reason to live. And we need to share that with all of our people, with our children, as Dr. Boom pointed out, some appreciation for that of which is around them, I think will go much, go far to improving our own society. And then we need functionality, which is we need governments that do their job. We need international institutions that do, and we need to find ways to give those who feel disenfranchised in our world hope for the future. And so um, I'm just really so grateful to all of our speakers for giving us so much to think about today. I, um, I'm a huge Israeli movie fan. 
And if you watch Israeli movies, you know that a lot of the most popular ones in recent years have shown families that speak Arabic and French at home and Hebrew when they're outside the home. And I confess as an Ashkenazic Jew, that was a part of Israel that I never got to see. And so it just really warms my heart now to see relations between Morocco and Israel um, going to the next step. It's a step where we've been before, as Mark, as Ambassador Ginsburg noted, but I'm, I'm so grateful to see them going to the next step now. I'm sure it means a lot to all of those families in Israel that do feel these strong ties to Morocco. But more importantly, it should give all of us hope in the future and a belief that we can move forward um, as long as we do find justice and peace um, for the Palestinian people, because really that's now the next phase of the Abrahamic Accords. So thank you again to everyone. And thank you again, Marilyn. Oh, Cecile, thank you for such a masterful job of weaving all of this together for us. And again, my thank you to everybody who participated today, to Anchi Emmett and to the Chicago Council for co-hosting this event. And it's obvious that we have to do event number two, because we didn't even begin to cover so many of the topics that, that, are, that are so important. And you're all invited back for phase two. And I stay well in time. Everybody stay safe. And as we do in Morocco, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Shalom and salam.